We are excited you glad we're excited you guys are here joining us this morning, hanging out with us, and uh, hopefully you guys have been enjoying the Flip series. Have you guys been enjoying the Flip sermon series? Right? Walking through it a few verses at a time, unpacking so many powerful truths that are contained in here. I know it's been a blessing to me, and I hope it's been a blessing to you as well. And this morning, we're going to continue on in that theme. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be there again this morning, and in just a few moments, we'll look at our, uh, today's passage. But before we get into today, I just want to throw out a disclaimer here this morning. For any parents that are in here, if you have your child, whether it's elementary or teens, this morning, we're going to be talking about lust. And so... I don't want, you know, if you don't want your child to hear that, we do have full children's ministry that you can take them to. The check-ins over there or middle school age. We have a, a uh, middle school for Corey, which is over here up on the second floor. If you want your child to go there, I just don't want to. The Bible says don't awaken love before it's time. And there's some things you may not want your child to hear about before it's time because children are curious. Whatever they hear, they're going to go look it up. They're going to ask Siri. They're going to Google it. And you may not want them to do that. Our children are smart. They know how to use technology, sometimes more than us. And so just a little spoiler alert, but uh, we'll, we'll dive into it now. Church, this morning, we are in desperate need of today's passage. Desperate, desperate need. There is an epidemic that is running rampant through our churches. There's this word lust that is destroying families, it's destroying relationships, it's destroying reputations, it's destroying testimonies, and most importantly, it is destroying people spiritually. Lust is a problem in our churches. Now, I'm sure there's many in here saying, Brad, lust isn't that big of a deal. What's the problem with lust? There's not really that big of a thing going on. Well, I, want, I, I don't normally do this because it can be kind of boring, but I'm doing it this morning because when I read these statistics, this is from two years ago in 2014, it blew me away because Christian men, people who claim to be Christians, even if it's a nominal Christian, they filled out this survey. And here's what they found. Uh, Proven Men Ministries and the Barna Group has found this out about Christian men. 55% look at pornography at least once a month. 35% of these Christian men cheated on their spouses. 77% of Christian men between the ages 18 to 30 view pornography at least monthly and 36% view it once a day. Now, here's this part of the survey where it talks about these Christian men who claim, I am a born again Christian. I'm a Bible believing Christian. I carry my Bible. I, am, I believe what God's word says. 95% say they have looked at pornography. 54% of born again Christians view pornography at least on a monthly basis. 44% admitted they've looked at pornography at work within the past three months. 25% admit that they hide their internet browsing by deleting their history on all their electronic devices. 18% admit they are addicted to porn. Nearly one-third of born-again Christians admitted to having an affair. Born-again Christians. Here's the state of America. 35% of men commit adultery. 17% of women commit adultery. And 75% of the men have had more than one affair. So we can sit back and say lust is not a problem. We can sit back and say lust is not that big of a deal. What these statistics show, it is a huge deal that destroys, corrupts, and perverts. And what these stats show is this is in our churches. This is among God's people. So this morning, we're gonna look at this. It shows us women and men are all prone to lusting. It's all prone to being taken down spiritually. We all struggle with it in some form or fashion. And in today's passage, Jesus is going to share four truths 
that are packed into these verses how we can stand victorious over lust in our lives. Let's read Matthew chapter 5, 27 through 30. Here's what Jesus says to his disciples. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and lose one of your members. For it is better, throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. If you would, let's bow our hearts and pray this morning. Father God, we desperately need your spirit at work in our lives. God, as we open up your word, it is only your spirit that teaches. It is only your spirit that provides understanding. It is only your spirit that can open our blind eyes, that can open our deaf ears, so that we could hear clearly your words speaking to us. So God, I pray this morning that Brad's words are not heard, but that your words are heard, that your name is lifted high, that you are glorified, and that you would do the work that only you can do. Because Father, with man, it's impossible. But with you, God, all things are possible, even as we struggle with lust. It's in your mighty and powerful name we pray. Amen. So here we have these verses that Jesus points out. And there's a few things that we have to keep in mind before we dig in and dive a little deeper into here. And so the first thing we have to remember is Jesus is talking to his disciples on the mountainside. He's giving this Sermon on the Mount as an encouragement to them. He's telling them, look, if you submit your lives to God and you follow him with everything that you are, here is the work of grace that God is going to do in your life. These are the characteristics that will come out of your life and you will demonstrate these attitudes and actions not based upon what you do, but based upon what God is doing in you. And he comes to this idea of adultery, this idea of lusting, and he wants to encourage them about this idea of lust. He wants them to understand that lust will not have a part in a kingdom citizen. So here's the second thing we need to remember is that we have to remember the Jewish culture that Jesus' disciples were under. The Jews took adultery very seriously. Does anybody know what the punishment for if you were caught in adultery was? Death. You were stoned to death. Okay? That was the penalty. And so the Jews followed that. If they caught somebody in adultery, they would stone. Both parties put them to death. And so the Jews, they, they took it very seriously. And if you remember the story in the Bible where the woman is caught in adultery, right? In the Gospel of Mark. And these religious leaders throw her down at Jesus' feet, wanting Jesus to stone them. You remember that story? Jesus points out the sin in their heart. And they turn and walk away. Then Jesus forgives that lady of her sins. So we know that the Jewish culture took adultery seriously. I mean, Exodus 20, 14 says, you shall not commit adultery. And so that's what they believed. That's what they held to. But their view of adultery was where they had a problem. They said, as long as I don't commit the act of adultery, I can lust after anybody I want to. I can check out that fine lady over there, or the ladies can check out any fine man they see over here, and as long as I'm not doing the act, everything is okay. You see, Pastor Brian, the same thing he pointed out with anger is that the, the religious leaders were so concerned about the letter of the law that they forgot about the spirit of the law. That if we harbor lust or anger in our hearts, it corrupts us. It affects us. It is a sin. It is adultery of the heart. And the religious leaders had missed that. They were focused on the letter. Just a few commandments down, 
they missed out where it said this in the Ten Commandments. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house. So there's this idea of lusting after something that you don't have. And they failed to see that that lust brought them down spiritually. That it brought hurt and pain and shame into their lives. Finally, some people in here might be saying, well, Brad, good thing this is talking to married people. You're not talking to me. This is addressing everybody in the room. Primarily, it addresses those that are married. Secondarily, the Bible condemns sexual immorality. It, con- it condemns sex outside of marriage, God's design for it. So lust is a problem for married and for singles. This passage is not just for married. It's for everyone this morning. Are you all with me? This topic is a force that needs God's redeeming grace to overcome. There's no other way that we can overcome lust. We're gonna look at three powerful truths this morning. The first one I put in your notes, I said it this way. I said, lust is rooted in the heart. In verse 28, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his what? Heart. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that the religious leaders got the law wrong. He wanted them to understand that as his kingdom citizens, they must live differently than the rest of the world. That there is a standard of living that God has called them to live. Ordinary people lust after everything. They lust after everything that their eyes see. And Jesus says, my kingdom citizens will not be this way. We will have God and honoring God before our, before our eyes. It'll be what we strive for. And we want to honor God with our sexuality. And as we move forward this morning, I want to clarify that lusting after a woman is not the same as committing the act of adultery. There is a difference. The act of committing adultery bears greater consequences. That yes, sin is sin and it's all deserving of judgment by a holy and just God. We all agree. But committing the act of adultery is worse than committing the lust in your heart. But both, Jesus says, are punishable by God our Father. And so, just to clarify that before we move forward, what Jesus wants us to understand is that lust is rooted in our hearts. That's where it begins. If we do not take care of our hearts, if we allow our hearts to see and desire everything it wants, it will always lead us to sin every time. If we let our hearts do everything it wants, please understand, if you say, I can do whatever I want, I can look at whatever I want, I can flirt with people at work that are not my spouse, I can do all those things and understand you're opening up your heart to fulfill its sinful desires. Because we sit back and we think, I'm a good person. I don't do what other people do. I don't go around and gossip like some people. I don't murder, I don't steal, I don't do these things and I'm, I'm a good person. But what the scriptures tells us is no, You're not a good person. Your heart is not a good heart. Here's what the Bible teaches us about our heart. The next thing you notice, I put it this way. Jesus exposes our wicked heart. Our hearts are wicked. Well, how do I know that, Brad? In Matthew chapter 15, verses 16 through 19, here is what Jesus has to say about our hearts. Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Check this, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witnesses, slander. What's the idea? If we don't guard our hearts, what comes out? Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, fornications, evil of all kinds. And we seem to think that, oh, our hearts are good, there's nothing wrong, I'm fine. No, if we don't check our hearts under God's grace, strength, and power, it will lead us to all unimaginable sins we never thought that we would ever 
commit. How many who has ever fallen in adultery sat back and said, I knew this was going to happen one day? No, what rings true is I never thought this would happen to me. But it does, because when you let your heart run loose with lust, this is what comes out of your heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Did you notice what he said? The heart is deceitful. Left to its own devices, it seeks out sin. And here's the worst part. It says deceitful, which means our heart can tell us things that it wants us to hear and their lies to us, and we believe them. How, how do I know? Have you ever heard a Christian say something like this? There's nothing wrong with pornography. There's nothing wrong with looking at porn. It's not gonna affect my life. That's a lie from our heart. Or how about this? We're living together and having sex. We're not married, but it's no big deal. We don't need to be married. Marriage today is almost taboo in our society. It's like, oh, you're married? I'm sorry. Right? Is that not the attitude? Like, oh, you got that whole ball and chain. Right? But those of us who know God's word knows that, be- that marriage is beautiful. Amen. Marriage is a picture of the gospel. Marriage is awesome because you can freely use the gift of sex and not feel shame, disgrace, embarrassment, and guilt. You can do something that honors God with your body when you're married. But lust wants us to think differently. Our heart wants us to think differently. Our heart will lie to us to tell us it's no big deal. Or, well, here's this one. Well, God gave me these urges, so I'm just doing what God gave me biologically. No, God gave you the gift of sex to be used as he designed it, not the way that we feel. And our our heart deceives us. It says, no, you can do that. It's no big deal. Your heart is lying to you. Those are not truths. Those are lies. Jesus's word, God's word reveals what is true about lust, not our hearts. And so why do I say all this? For you to understand, if you don't guard and protect your heart and submit your lives to God, your heart is going to produce all kinds of evil when it comes to lust. And it will take you down spiritually. It'll take you down roads you never thought you would ever go down before. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. Lust begins in the heart. That's where it begins. The the writer James, he shows the progression of temptation, sin, and lust, and how it produces sin, which then produces death. Look at what it says in James chapter, James chapter one, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do you guys see the progression of sin there? Now, whenever we get into, whenever we do choose to sin, because it's ultimately our desire, one of the first things we like to do is say, God, how dare you give me these urges? How dare you allow this woman to be in front of me? It's not my fault, God, that I'm looking at her lustfully. You put her here, God. You gave me this job, and we blame God for our temptations. This goes back as far as Adam and Eve. You remember they got caught in sin? And what did Adam do? Well, God, you know, you created this lady for me, and you know what? She also told me to eat it. She ate it first. Then Eve, she blamed the serpent. And what does everybody do? They blame God instead of taking responsibility. And so here James says, look, when you're tempted, it's not God tempting you. You're sinful. You're a sinner. You are enticed by your sinful desires. It is you. Sin begins with me. Sin begins with you. When you sin, it's our fault. This is what James says. Then he goes on and he says, the second thing is that temptations arise. And when the temptations arise, we sit there and we let it linger or marinate in our brains. We sit back and we start to think about that lustful thought. Man, it really would be nice to do that. If only, and the temptation comes, and it sits, and it lingers, 
And then what does it do? It produces sin in your heart. Now, temptation is not a sin. Temptations come. That's not a sin. Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet he was without what? Without sin. You see, you can trace the progression of, of lust. There's a story in the Bible, you'll probably, most of us should have heard of King David. As the story goes, he's going out one night to go on the top of, on his roof to go look out at his, his, his kingdom, his palace. And it says as he walks out there that he notices a woman bathing on a roof. Temptation, right? It wasn't like he planned it, like, okay, I'm going to go out at 8 o'clock. And, uh, like, it, he's out there, the temptation comes, but then what does he do? He stares. Then he finds out about her. Who is that bathing over there? Servant says, well, you know, that's Bathsheba. She's married to, to her husband here. And he goes, well, go get her for me. What started out as a temptation turned to him lingering with his look. Then that turned to lust. Even finding out she was married, it didn't matter at that point. His lust took over. His evil heart took over. And he slept with her and committed sin. You see, if we allow these temptations to linger and marinate in our brain, it will turn to lust. And temptations are around us. Do you not see them? We can look at media. The world knows that sex sells. Well, how do I know that? Have you guys ever seen those Axe body spray commercials? Use their shampoo, use their cologne, use their body spray, and what happens? You're going to get all the girls in the world. All you got to do is spray this on. So what does it say? Chase after girls. Or how about this, car commercials. If you buy our car, there's going to be a hot lady for you. As soon as you drive around in your car, you're going to have it. Or I went to a heat game recently. Do you know what they do at every intermission, it seems like, or almost every time out? They have heat dancers wearing practically nothing, dancing on the floor. Why are they doing that? Because they know that sex sells. Because they know that lust is a powerful tool that will get people to buy their products, that will get you to come back. I can mention the Hooters restaurant. I don't need to say anything else. Why do they do that? Because they know that sex sells. They know that we are lustful people. They know that this is what will get us to, to go to their companies. We have access to porn on our phones, on our devices. We don't have to go far to look at it. You can Google toothbrushes and find a naughty picture without even looking for it. <laughs> Temptations come up everywhere. And some people have said that our society now, that it is worse than at any other time in history. Because think about how easy it is to access and fulfill our lustful desires. 11-year-olds are lusting. Why? 11 year olds because they have access to lustful images that they've never had in any other time in history. It's a struggle for all ages, all men, all women. Now, understand, I'm not saying that all of us are ever going to be in a place where we are no longer tempted because temptations are gonna come and I came across this quote from Martin Luther and I love it, I think the imagery is great. This is what he has to say about temptations and this is the attitude that we need to have because when he was battling against lust, here is what he said, I cannot help it if birds fly around my head but I can keep them from nesting in my hair. Can't stop the birds but we can say, hey, get out of my hair. When you're being tempted with lust, you have the opportunity through God's grace to say, I'm not going to allow this thought to nest in my brain. I'm going to say, God, help me. God, remove this temptation from me. And in, in the case of Joseph, if you need to run away, like literally run out of a room, run. If you need to kick your computer off your desk, kick your computer. But you don't have to allow that lustful desire, to, that temptation to become a lustful desire. That thought doesn't have to linger in your brain. Lust is rooted in the heart, and we must guard our hearts. Here's the second thing I wrote in my notes. Lust destroys. Lust destroys. In verse 29 and 30, you see, if your right eye causes you to sin, do what? Tear it out, throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, what do you do? Cut it off and throw it away. And so I put down two things. What does lust destroy? 
I put the first one this way. Lust destroys purpose. Lust destroys purpose. Here Jesus shows that lust perverts and destroys God's gifts that he's given to us. If you notice that Jesus specifically mentions the right eye and the right hand. And what you may not know is during this time, the right eye and the right hand was a symbol of strength and a symbol of power, right? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. There's this idea of power. And so here what happens is when somebody commits this lustful sin, Jesus says, take out that right eye, take, out the, take off that right arm. So what God had meant for us for good is now destroyed because of fulfilling our lustful desires. You see, here's what happens when lust is allowed to grow in our hearts. Our eyes and our hands are no longer used for God's purposes. Have you ever seen that happen in your life? You see, here's what 2 Peter 2.14 says. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. The eye, which was one of God's precious gifts, was to be used to share, to love God, to love others, and share the gospel. And here, it's being used to fulfill and commit lustful adultery. The eye is not being used for its purpose that God had given it to us for. The same thing with our hands. It can be used as an instrument of unrighteousness. And God is telling us, his disciples, that when we allow lust to take over our lives, it destroys being used for God's purposes. You see, here's what happens when people give in to lust. They quit serving, right? How can I go and serve in a ministry when I know what I'm doing on the weekends? When I know what I'm doing at work? when there's an inappropriate relationship with somebody who's not my spouse? How can I go and be the hands and feet of God? And so what do these people do? They sit on the sidelines, not being used by God, not fulfilling the purpose that God had saved them for. Now, how do I know that? Because I had a time in my life as a born-again Christian where I struggled with that. I had struggled with pornography years ago. And when I was struggling with pornography... I quit serving, wasn't active in the church. Why? How can I go and share something if I'm doing these naughty things behind the scenes? How can I go and be used by God when I'm fulfilling my own lustful desires? It didn't bring me closer to God. It was like, whoo, porn has really helped my relationship with the Lord. No, you don't want to open the Bible because the Bible will convict you. The Bible points it out, and so instead of you growing in your relationship with Christ, you sit on the sidelines and you shrink, and you're not being used. You're, not, you're an instrument that God has saved, redeemed, and sanctified, but you're doing nothing because you got lust in your heart. It wasn't until I came to Christ, confessed it, and asked for a clean heart that God began to fulfill his purpose in my life. And so your purpose can be destroyed. You can miss out on being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ because you're allowing lust to be in your heart. God has saved you, redeemed you to love him, but to love others. The apostle Paul encourages us, God has given you gifts and talents. Use it to build up the body of Christ. But you can't if you're struggling with lust and you're your own ministry. Am I making sense? Romans 6.13 says this, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Proverbs 4, 25, 26 talks about our eyes and our feet. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. God wants to use your eyes, your hands, your feet, who you are for his purpose, for his glory, for his honor. God can use you to reach somebody with the gospel who is lost and far from him. But we ruin that opportunity when we allow sin and lust to take control of our hearts. Here's the second thing lust destroys. It destroys our identity. Destroys our identity. 
Christ has called us to be his kingdom citizens. We are witnesses to the world. We bear the name of Jesus Christ. When you say, I'm a born again Christian, you bear Christ's name. We have an identity that is found in Christ. We are justified, sanctified, redeemed. We are children of a king. He has given us an identity and lust can destroy that identity. How how does it destroy that identity? Well, here's how it plays out. To the rest of the world that's watching, for the rest of the world that's waiting for Christians, just like you and I to mess up, here's what they see when we allow lust to take control of our hearts. They see a marriage designed by God to be a picture of the gospel. They see it broken and destroyed. It's not the identity of God's marriages. When they look at our lives, they'll see that God has called us for sexual purity before marriage, but there's many singles that are suffering pregnancies, STDs, shame, embarrassment. Why? Because they're giving in to their lustful desires. And that takes away from who we are. It brings a name. It changes our identity. Reputations, are they not destroyed when adulteries happen? You can Google churches and pastors who have failed because they allowed lust in their hearts. Takes away from the identity. This is not who God's people should be. You have uh, reputations, whether it's pornography, it could be sexual immorality, it could be adultery, it could be whatever it is, can ruin our reputations, our testimonies as God's people. Here's how God's word describes people with lust. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Does that sound like that describes God's people? It doesn't. But here's what Jesus says. He doesn't want his people, his disciples, to identify themselves with what's described here. Right? Doesn't Paul write to the Corinthians, tell them, look, you guys used to do this. You've been saved, quit going back. This is why he's writing it. Do you not know? You are saved. This is not who you are. This is not your identity. Move away from your old life. Quit going back. Hebrews 13, 4 says this. Let the marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Those overcome by lust, that give their lives to lust, here in these verses are described as those that, are, that don't inherit the kingdom of God. But I want to make something very clear. What I am not saying, this is what I'm not saying, is that Christians can lose their salvation. It's not what I'm saying. When you give your life to Christ, when Christ saves you, redeems you, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But here's Jesus' encouragement telling his disciples. He's saying this, my disciples will be different. My disciples will not use lust like the world uses lust. If you hang on to me and seek to fulfill my purpose and my identity in your life, this is what your life will look like. And the admonition is, if you're involved in these things as a Christian, turn to Christ, run away understand your purpose understand your identity you are a kingdom citizen used for God's honor third thing I put in my notes is this lust should be dealt with drastically and immediately if you notice it says if your right eye caused you to sin tear it out if your right hand caused you to sin cut it off right it says cut it off right now Next thing in my notes I put it is, is this, get rid of all stumbling blocks. Look at what he says, tear it out, cut it off. That's a drastic measure. That means whatever it is that your eye is looking at or your hand is doing, that is lust. The Bible says to cut it out of your life. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say cut this out of your life when you're ready. It doesn't say cut it out of your life when you're comfortable, right? Because sometimes we deceive ourselves and say, well, you know what? I'm going to wean myself off. I'm only going to look one or two pictures today. 
Then maybe next month I'll start with just one. I'll do once a week. I'll start. No. Jesus says, cut it out now. It has to be drastic because the more we baby our sin, the more it's going to grow. It cannot happen if we don't make a drastic move. And this is what Jesus says, make it drastic. Now, the right eye and the right hand, I alluded to this before. The right eye was always seen. The eyes were seen as God's precious gift to us, is it not? We can see all of God's creations. We can see God's handiwork. It's a gift of God. It's precious. And and, and the hand, Jesus mentions the hand, and his disciples would have understood why. And here Jesus says, look, if your eye, which is precious, and your hand, which is your livelihood, causes you to lust, cut them off. What's the idea? Whatever is most precious and dear to you, be willing to get rid of it for the sake of your heart and for the sake of your soul. Might be something like this. Sometimes we hold on to things in our life. Maybe it could be stop watching movies and TV shows filled with sex. Maybe it's getting rid of the computer that you have. Maybe it's cutting off an inappropriate relationship with someone who's not your spouse. Sorry, not sorry, your spouse is your best friend, not somebody else. Turn the channel when something inappropriate comes on TV. Could be getting rid of books that make you lust. It could be, hey, quit going to strip clubs. Here's the idea. Do whatever is necessary to avoid lust. Be willing to give up everything to maintain the integrity of your heart. Am I making sense? Colossians 3, 5 says this. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. I love the imagery there, put to death. That has nothing to do with playing around with sin. It says, put it to death. There's a responsibility, a mindset that we must have to say, I'm gonna put to death these lustful desires so I can live as God's kingdom citizen. Second Corinthians 7, 1 says this, since we have these promises, beloved, Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. See, we have to understand that our lust, our sin, offends a holy and just God. Our sin grieves the Holy Spirit. Understand that when you allow lust to breed in your heart. It offends God, our Father. Get rid of that. Get the cleansing you need so you can bring holiness and a fear of God. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Every weight and sin. Get rid of it. Do whatever you have to do to protect your identity and purpose in Christ from being overtaken by lust. Job 31.1, he made a bold declaration in his life. He determined, he set a mind, his mind to this thought. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? You see, he understood the power that lust could have in his life. So he said, I made a covenant to not look at anyone because if I look at them, I'm going to lust and I'm going to sin. He took it seriously. And he did something about it immediately. So when it comes to our sin, deal with it drastically. Deal with it immediately. Here's the last thing in your notes, and we'll close with this. Because we can try all we want and all our might and all our power and all our strength and fail. Because if we do it all on our own, we're going to fail. So how do we overcome lust? Because it's powerful, it's in us, it's deceiving, it's strong, it's an impulse, it's urging. What's the answer? It's like what the Apostle Paul says when he says, I know what I should do and I don't do it. And I know what I shouldn't do and I do it. So who can save me 
this wretched man that I am? Who can save me from this body of death? He says, thank Christ Jesus. Seek Christ for a pure heart. Seek Christ for a pure heart. This is how we overcome lust in our life. This is how we have victory over it. It is a every day Every moment depended on God's grace, not mine. God's mercy, not mine. God's love, not mine. It's dependent solely upon God, saying, God, Christ, help me. Give me victory. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from the evil one. If we we read those verses, but sometimes we don't pray them. But Jesus is saying, pray these verses. This is how you pray. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. And what is that doing? You are relying on God's provision and strength for your life, not your own. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You see, it is God working in your heart that brings change. It's the only thing that can bring change in your life. Scriptures say you have not because you ask not. And sometimes we try to just deal with lust on our own and totally bypass God, the creator who spoke life into existence. He has the power to change you. After David sinned with Bathsheba he confessed his sin and in Psalm 51 you can read that later you can read the whole thing on your own but after he sinned he confessed it to God he realized that he had blown it that he had messed up that he allowed lust to overtake him and commit sin and look at what he says in Psalm 51 verse 10 create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me. It's a beautiful line of poetry there. Because number one, it shows David's dependence on God. But number two, it shows the graciousness of God to create a clean heart and to renew a right spirit when we've blown it. Doesn't matter how many times we've blown it, the beauty of the gospel is that God's grace and love is forever to his children. That yes, when we sin, God will discipline us. God will chasten us. Just like if your child acts up, you're gonna punish that child. But it's for the love that you have for your child. The same thing with God. And here, David understood that when he asked for God, God will give him a clean heart. God will renew a right spirit within him. That guilt, that shame will go away. That God will set you with a purpose and an identity. That you will live as his kingdom citizens. It's a beautiful picture that our God, no matter how many times we fall, God will lift us up. I know Pastor Brian a few weeks ago mentioned that passage where it says, Though the righteous man may fall seven times, he will get up again. It's because the love of our Father for us and the beauty of the cross is that victory over lust. See, we sit back and we think that maybe this is impossible. We could never beat this. That lust is something that always comes up. Maybe I should just throw in the towel and give up. No, no, no. Scriptures say we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And so too many times we walk around defeated. And we're like, well, nothing's going to change this time. Well, it's not changing because you're trying to do it. But with God, all things are possible. Victory over lust is possible. So we read those verses, and if we believe them, and if you believe that God's word is the very word of God, then pray them. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me.
And it's not a one-time prayer. It is an every day, every moment, dependent upon God. And when you do that, watch and see how God will give you victory. How God will give you victory. How God will set you free from the shame and the pain of lust.